Welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for joining us. Well, we must talk about road construction. It's everywhere, and it's important. But first, let's talk about some of the issues in state government that affect all of us, and we'll do that after these words. Welcome to the fast-paced and unrehearsed weekly discussion featuring the leaders who help shape your world. Join us as we address the issues that impact you each and every day. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Well, we have some very, very important issues to talk about, and I couldn't have two better guests uh, to start the program than John Meisick. He's the editor-in-chief of Pennsylvania Capital Star, and Jim Murphy, she's the capital reporter for Penn Live Patriot News. All right, Jan, let's start with you. We're going to talk about education. Josh Shapiro recommends a $44 billion budget for the upcoming fiscal year. That's point number one. Point number two, the Democrats in the legislature increased the spending by 13 percent, if I understand this. And a good bit of that goes to an issue that you're a real expert on. It's called education. <laughs> so what, what, what did they do and why did they do it? Well, um, you're right. And, and <laughs> you know, this, this whole budget discussion this year, it, it totally is revolving around the educational spend. And uh, part of it has to do with this February Commonwealth Court decision that, that ruled our education funding system you know, needs work. It not, it's not guaranteeing a quality education for all children, which right. is what our Constitution requires. And so that is weighing on the backs of legislators. But in addition to that, um, what has everybody in the, in the whole Capitol talking about is this issue of lifeline scholarships, which is a, a taxpayer-funded tuition grant program that would allow children in the um, who attend the the 15 percent worst performing schools in the state, which is about 371 of them, uh, to get a grant, a taxpayer funded grant of $10,000 for um, most students, or 5,000 or less for kindergartners or elementary kids, and um, they could use that to attend a private right. or religious school. And what's interesting about this is called Lifeline Scholarships. Is that Governor Shapiro last year on the campaign trail said he was open to that concept. And so now we have a situation where the governor is supporting it. The Senate Republicans are all for it. For it, of course. Supposedly, they have some kind of agreement over it. But the House Democrats, who control that chamber, their guy who supports this uh, voucher program, right. they are yeah. adamantly against it. And there's also a higher ed component. The recommendation was only for, I think, a 2 percent increase for the 14 publicly owned universities now. I'm a senior fellow at Millersville University and an alum, so I have to, I want to get that out. And that would have, if, and that, there was some concern about that because that would have led to tuition hikes at the public universities. Yeah, I mean, just to, to Jan's point, uh, you know, this, these scholarships are something Shapiro talked about on the campaign trail in 2022, so it's not like it's coming out of the blue here. Um, that has nonetheless aggravated his allies in organized labor, notably PSEA and um, right. AFT and PFT um, in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, the two big city, union, city school unions out there. This will probably, you know, just gravitate towards a deal because, and, and Democrats will be consoled by the fact that they're getting, you know, all of this new spending for K-12 education. And Terry, you know, as we sit here, um, spend, uh, and again, this could all change by the time sure. this program airs. Sure. Um, the appropriations for Pennsylvania state-related uh, universities School, right. are hung up right now. That, again, that, that could change in, by the time we get off the air here, but it's one thing that's still sort of hanging out there. Yeah. And the other a a as aspect of this is that the uh, governor, when he talked about, you know, money for private schools, basically vouchers, what he said is he wouldn't take the money away that would go to the public schools. You know that would right. remain what he recommended. Right, and that's what I mean. They're and that is their uh, the supporters of Lifeline scholarships. That's what they keep emphasizing that it will be a separate pot of money. Right. 
the the funding that goes to school districts it will it will go up by hundreds of millions of dollars no doubt because Pennsylvania right now we're sitting on like 13 billion dollars sure. in our reserves yeah. so right. Reserve. Um, yeah. and and we have this court decision that's saying we're not spending enough yeah. on education yeah. so yeah. there's but there's, it's not like the money isn't there right that's that's, that's right that's one of the issues all right when we run to a break John when we come back uh, uh, I want to talk about something we don't often deal with when it comes to a subject, it's called probation reform. Do I got that right? Correct. All right, we'll talk to uh, John Meisig about probation reform after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business, and by the Pennsylvania State Education Association, bringing the power of a great education to our schools, our students, and our communities. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Please visit pahighwayinfo.org. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. All right, John Meisig, uh, probation reform. What's that about? Why should the people care about it? Sure. So, Terry, when people come out of custody, they go on parole, and oftentimes they go on probation after that. It's a form of supervised release, um, just to help them ease back into, into society. There's been a complaint for a long time that the way prob Pennsylvania's probation system is structured, it keeps people in that system for too long. Um, and what are known as there there are technical what are known as technical violations that it is too easy for those to take place, thus returning people to returning people to custody. Um, you know, there was a bill sponsored by Senator Lisa Baker, pardon me, Lisa Baker and okay. Cameron Bartolotta in the Senate, that came, with the backing of Tony Williams, a Democrat from Philadelphia, that came out just the other day, um, just days after it was introduced and just a day after it was reported out of committee. It's now before the state house. Um, it looks like it's going to land on Governor Josh Shapiro's desk. Um, some folks, including the American Civil Liberties Union of PA, have complained that the bill is flawed and that it does, it does not go far enough. Far enough. Um, Senator Sharif Street, Sharif Street, pardon me, I'm having trouble talking this morning. Um, <laughs> Fine. You know, he, and during floor debate, he also acknowledged that the bill doesn't go far enough, but also said that it's a good start. Um, you know, I've, t I've talked to one probationer who says the system as it's structured now is a one-size-fits-all approach, that the chances, that the opportunities to sort of trip and fall and to go back into custody are too numerous. So any sort of fix, at least right, right now, appears to be welcome. Um, so that's what's moving there. This is another piece kind of the, of the criminal justice reform we've seen for the last okay. few years. Yeah. I mean, I, as John said, it can be something as small as missing a hearing, missing an appointment, mm -hmm. you know, with a, a probation officer. It can send you back to jail. And that's, it's like that kind of stuff is what that whole yeah, issue I mean, begins this, to This address. one gentleman I talked to was in a car accident and was put in hospital for two weeks, missed his appointment with his probation officer, didn't return to custody, but had another year tacked onto his term. That's oh how my. sort of labyrinthine this system is. So reform is uh, uh, running front page, as, as you all, you newspaper. All right, yes. Jan, I gotta ask you something. Pennsylvania is a big hunter state. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wanna tell you, come hunting season, you know, you know, you know it's there. You know uh, people are out hunting. And now we have something called online hunting licenses. Is that right? That's What's right. This online, you can get them on. Yep. How first many year. millions of people will apply for them? Well, there's been hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. <laughs> and, right. and there was over 100,000, over I think 160 some thousand on day one. And the problem is, is we just introduced that this year. And not only can you get your hunting license, at the same time you can get a, a doe tag and trust me I'm not a hunter my husband is so that's the only reason I know anything about this okay but um yeah so you know all these hunters were they wanted to get their doe tag they wanted to get you know get there on and get their purchase because they know it is a first come first serve to get the doe tags and so as a result with this new online system are you uh, still <laughs> able to get them in person by going you to can a still get them office. in person but 
you also can get them online because we're moving to that whole convenience factor of being yes, able to do everything yourself. Yes. And um, so, I mean, I, for my husband, I, I decided to put this system to the test and I signed one at eight o'clock on Monday morning whenever they first went on sale. And at eight o'clock, I was 11,235 online. Is that at all? Just 11? <laughs> Just 11. So then it took me five and a half hours till I finally got my 10 minute window to oh be able my. to buy that license. And so there's, you know, people were missing work and, and all that. And so it, Representative David Maloney, a Republican from Berks County, was a hunter and, and I just outraged by how that whole system was Are there reforms out. that people have already talking about? Yeah, he, I mean, well, the, the the Game Commission said, you know, they they realized one of the things they got to do is educate hunters that you don't have to be, you know, they are first in line. That Because it took until um, day three, the third, like about mid, the middle of the third mm -hmm. day till the doe tags and one mm -hmm. uh, wildlife management unit was, were sold out. So there's, you know, there's plenty of doe tags, but it was like every, it was the first yeah. time. And like they said, change is hard until we get everyone yeah, on yeah. board with the new system. Well, people in my work. family hunt. I, I don't hunt. I don't know about, I, 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 no. I'm not a hunter. I, I, not, I used to do a lot of fishing. I, I fished. My idea of roughing it is a hotel without room service. So <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> yeah. But uh, so, but it's obvious from what you're saying that they're going to keep it. Oh yeah, yeah. It's yeah, not going to go away. It's not going to go away. They, there's some ch like um, one of the other parts of that uh, Representative Maloney complained about is that every time you bought a license, you were charged like four dollars and forty cents service fee. And he's like, no, wait wow. a minute, that wasn't in the legislation. That's something the Game Commission decided to tack on. And he said, if it's like a father buying, you know, hunting licenses for his family, he shouldn't have to pay four dollars and forty cents every time. Yeah. So I, I do think we're going to see more reforms either from the Game Commission or, or the yeah, legislature. Sure. All right, thanks for coming on. I'll tell you, you can't drive any, anywhere in this state. It's road construction, it's everywhere, and it's important, and we'll get to that. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Cross-State Credit Union Association. Credit unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, go to ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Association of Pennsylvania State College and University Faculties, representing the faculty and coaches who are devoted to providing quality public higher education for Pennsylvania's college students. As I like to say, it is everywhere. Joining me to talk about uh, what could be unprecedented road construction is Bob Latham. He's the executive vice president of the Associated Pennsylvania Constructors and one of the leading experts on uh, construction, road construction, bridges, and others, and he's a uh, regular on our program. All right, Bob, I'll tell you, I can't drive anywhere in this state and have to wait in line or someone with a flag saying, go here, go there. Well, the old joke is we have two seasons in Pennsylvania, winter and road construction season. <laughs> I so, like that. I like so that. We, we can live with that. But sure. uh, obviously, we have to do the work between uh, spring and fall uh, for, uh, for temperature reasons and for weather reasons and that sort of thing, which is why we have to compress a lot of it into the construction season uh, over the summertime and why it looks like there's a lot of work going on out there, which there is. Uh, and the other thing that makes it seem so is almost all the work that we do uh, construction-wise, of course, is on existing roadways under traffic. We're not building much in the way of new, new highways, uh, haven't really for for many, many years. I'd say the, the job up in Sealands Grove, Central Susquehanna Valley Thruway, that's about the only really major new artery. There's some things going on out in Pittsburgh with the Mon Valley Expressway. But again, by and large, it's all... It's all existing roadways improvements, and we've talked about it before because of our climate, because of our uh, our geography. We've got a yeah. lot of rivers, we've got a lot of mountains, yeah. we got a lot of freeze thaw. That plays we have havoc a complicated with, geography right. in Pennsylvania, don't that we? That plays havoc with roads, and we have to continually rebuild them, and and that's what we do. Yeah, and how is it being paid for? 
Well, uh, motorists who uh, buy gasoline at the pump, <laughs> <laughs> uh, those who have electric vehicles, not so much. We're trying to change that. We like to see a reasonable fee uh, be assessed on, motor on motorists who own electric vehicles. We're going to see more and more of them. The fleet is going to turn over. And, uh, and we've got two things going on with electric vehicles. First of all, they're heavier than conventional vehicles, so they do cause more damage to the roads. And currently, they're not paying anything. So, And that's a big debate right now about whether other electric vehicles, you know, there should be some yeah. payment made for the uh, conditions Actually, of the, the, the Senate did pass legislation that would impose right. a reasonable uh, $290 a year fee, which is about commensurate with what, uh, you know, people who drive gasoline-powered vehicles pay in gas taxes. So it would be, you know, just so that the electric vehicle owners pay their fair share of road user fees. Actually, they, they use the same roads. There should be some sort of a fee structure there. The Senate passed it. It's in the House? Yes. And <laughs> you know I was going to have to well, <laughs> well, there'll be some debate on, over what's the appropriate levels. I would imagine it's going to be an issue that goes, that spills into the fall. And, you know, we're, we're hearing that almost all the policy issues are being pushed off to the fall as we try to uh, talk about the budget, which, you know, we heard from earlier yeah, <laughs> on, yeah. on the program. So, uh, so we're looking and we're optimistic that maybe by the end of this year we'll have a, something in place on that. But, uh, but yeah, the motorists pay the fees. It's a, again, you, if you drive car, the more you drive, the more you pay. It's yeah. a, it's a user yeah. system and, and that's how they fund roads, both at the, and yeah. there's a state and a federal component. Of and it. I, and I say this all the time, we have a big complicated state where, and people travel throughout it, uh, you know, Go, going to uh, places, uh, resorts in the state. We just talked about hunting, mm -hmm. fishing. Uh, so we have a whole variety of social and recreational and economic aspects that are critically important in well, terms of... Well, you're absolutely uh, right. We have the major arteries, which are our interstates. We're going to talk yeah, about one yeah. here shortly. Uh, but, you know, the, the hunters, I mean, uh, uh, people out <laughs> in the uh, in, in rural areas, we have smaller uh, volume roads, but PennDOT still has to uh, maintain those. We actually have some money in the uh, Pennsylvania Highway Program that goes to what we call dirt and gravel roads, and they, right. would, they would serve as people going to state parks and hunting and that sort of thing. So, yes, it goes mm -hmm. everywhere from from six, eight-lane interstate highways down to little dirt roads that uh, still have road. to be, yeah. be maintained yeah. with gravel, et cetera. All right, let's run to a break. When we come back, I want to talk about a huge story, the maybe, as you point out, the biggest transportation story of the year. That's the collapse of the I-95 bridge in northeast Philly and its impact after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Medical Society. Inspired physicians committed to the good health of Pennsylvanians and the advancement of the practice of medicine. All right, the I-95 bridge collapse, I'll tell you, that was huge. It was an international story, Bob Latham, so let's talk about it. Well, it seems like uh, the uh, when Pennsylvania gets notoriety, it's over uh, highway disasters. We had one in Pittsburgh last year. Um, but the good news with the coming out of that is it really shined at the attention on how important our roadway network is to the economy, to quality of life. Uh, and how important it is to society. So when you when you see a major artery like I-95 go down, the impact is is actually incredible. 160,000 cars a day uh, go over that stretch. Uh, more than a hundred billion dollars in freight crosses uh, through Philadelphia and trucks, much of it through I-95. That's according to Bloomberg at Bloomberg and. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a vital economic corridor. It's also for people commuting and getting around and that sort of thing. So we, we, it, what I'm trying to say here is the importance of our roadway network and maintaining it and make sure, making sure that it is well-funded uh, can't be emphasized enough. So let's look at what happened there. Uh, everybody knows the tanker fire, the bridge collapsed. Uh, I have had some questions, well, how come steel can't? can't hold up to that. Well, I'd say, have you ever heard of a blast furnace? I mean, that was basically the heat that, that hit, right. the, hit the steel beams there and collapsed. 
What we saw uh, in the reopening was government and private industry coming together in an unprecedented fashion. Uh, Governor Shapiro's leadership, uh, yeah. leadership of local elected officials, and I definitely... And it was remarkable how well coordinated all that was. Right. And so uh, we had uh, uh, private companies, members of our association on site within hours. Uh, and they had a program put together. Uh, I have to also give a lot of credit to Secretary, PennDOT Secretary Mike right, Carroll, who right. literally did not leave the site until the thing was rebuilt. Uh, running interference with uh, other officials when it had to happen, making, uh, making decisions, and allowing private industry to do their job. So when we have the time, when we have the money, and we mm -hmm. have the, uh, uh, the will of, uh, of government officials, we can, we can really work miracles, and, uh, and Buckley and company yep. and the others did. Yep, 12 days instead of the full two weeks. Right, uh, also the innovative uh, uh, material that they were able to put in there, um, recycled glass, uh, reblasted glass uh, aggregate. Uh, again, uh, these things are not cheap. They're much more expensive than conventional things, but, uh, uh, but it was a way to get it done, and the importance of getting that open w can't, be, uh, uh, can't be overstated. Yeah. Now, we're also uh, looking ahead, supposed to get uh, something like $5 billion in federal transportation money over the next five years. Well, uh, in 2021, when Congress passed the uh, what they call the bipartisan infrastructure law, Penn, Pennsylvania did yet get an additional four to five billion over five years. Uh, that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that inflation really eat, eats, eats into all, all, yeah. all, almost all of it. So. Uh, we still need an influx of money. We're still sending $500 million a year out of the money that, money, that right. you and I pay in gas taxes and license fees over to, the, to prop up the general fund in order to pay for the state police. So we need to, we need to once and for all get and, that job and done. you and I have chatted about that. Absolutely. It's not that we don't want the state police funded properly. It's where... Should the money come from the transportation side uh, of the ledger? Again, the governor uh, put forth a proposal that would create a fund for the state police and law enforcement. We support that. Uh, it would move uh, 100 million over over a period of time. The Senate has a plan that would uh, accelerate that on the front end. Um, so we're hopeful to, to, that that will happen in this budget session. Yeah. Before I let you go, automated speed enforcement. It's controversial. Some say that. You know, deaths aren't caused by speed alone. And, uh, you know, there are bills that have been moving back and forth between the House and the Senate. I'll say this. Uh, a national uh, research organization, the Road Information Program, came out with a study last week showing that motorist fatalities are up ev in Pennsylvania everywhere but highway work zones. And we're saying that because we have automated speed enforcement and people know that they could get a ticket in the mail, uh, they're slowing down when they go through highway work zones. So that has to be reauthorized and, and expanded somewhat. Well, you, you on the end note, is it going to get reauthorized? That what, get, I yes. have to put you on Hopefully, the spot. Well, yes, I think it will be. We have some details to hash out, but it's very important to keep that program going. Yeah, yeah. And uh, who knows with the Pennsylvania legislature, right, <laughs> how long they'll remain in well, session? Well, I, th I, th I think as far as the budget is concerned, they're going to they're gonna work on that, pass the budget, and then everything else will be in the fall. There you go. Right. All right, we'll see you next week for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers. And as always, you stay well.